Hello, this is Professor James Strickler, and this is Political Science 1101, American Government. This lesson from Unit 1, Theories of Government, is Lesson 12, about conservatism. In this lesson, you'll learn about the ideas of Edmund Burke, including his notions of the wisdom of history. And from his ideas, you'll get the basic tenets of conservatism. And then we'll conclude by discussing how the term reactionary is applied to conservatism. Last lesson, we learned about the notion of what, it, what a liberal was 200 years ago in the context of the divide in the French National Assembly between the liberals or radicals who wanted to get rid of the king and the monarchists that wanted to keep the king. Now, when we first brought up this idea a couple lessons ago, we described the mar monarchists as being conservative, wanting to preserve and keep things the way they were. Well, why did they? Why did they want to, get, want to keep the king rather than get rid of him like the radical liberals wanted to? Well, we can understand this by looking to the ideas of one particular person who, while not a member of the French National Assembly, um, agreed with the notion of the monarchists there that the king should be preserved. And that was Edmund Burke. Edmund Burke was a member of the Parliament in England. And as he watched what was happening across the English Channel in France, as, they, as the radicals, in fact, won this argument and dethroned the king and cut off the king's head and instituted their new radical government, he was shocked by what he saw. And he believed that it would inevitably lead to failure. Now, this is an interesting position for Edmund Burke to take because just a few years before, at the time of the American Revolution, he had looked at the uh, colonists' efforts to get rid of their ties to the English king, and he had shown approval for what they did. So we have to wonder, why did Edmund Burke oppose the French Revolution and thought it was doomed to failure and a bad idea, while he approved the American Revolution? Well, the answer to that question, and thereby the answer to why... Um, people like him thought that French, the French should not abandon their king. It be seen in the tenets of a philosophical point of view that today we call conservatism. Now we look to Edmund Burke for an explanation of this because Edmund Burke is oftentimes referred to as the father of conservatism. As uh, he didn't really give birth to these notions, but he presented them in a systematic way in this book that we'll be taking some quotes from his reflection on the revolution in France, he uh, presented them in a systematic way to help us understand what this ideology believes in. So let's begin our exploration of these tenets of conservatism presented by Edmund Burke with a quote from him about other people that are thinking about political philosophy, not himself. In particular, these radical liberals that he saw around, people like John Locke, Adam Smith that we talked about in the previous lesson, and others. Now, he refers to them in this quote as a clan of the enlightened among us. And his concern was that they didn't have respect for others, for the wisdom of others, because they think that little or nothing had been done properly before they came along. Essentially, he's accusing these people of intellectual conceit, that they um, believe that they have a better idea than what people had had before. Now, it's possible that they actually do have a better idea, but Edmund Burke is suspicious and doubtful of that. And one of the reasons is that he thinks that they despise the wisdom that came before them. And they come up with all kinds of abstract theories about things. Now, when I say abstract theories, what I mean is things that haven't been tested in the real world. They're sitting there in their office alone, just thinking about what things might be. And this leads them to certain conclusions. And Edmund Burke says that while these things may be philosophically, or the word he uses here, metaphysically true, that in the reality of life, they are neither morally nor politically true. And this is one of the themes of Edmund Burke's criticisms, is that uh, you oftentimes get people who come up with ideas of the way they think the world should be that are not grounded in the reality of how things work, actually work. And then when they try to institute them, 
it ends up to le leading to disastrous results. And he thinks there's a way to avoid this. And that is to recognize that even smart people, all on their own, have a limited stock. In other words, a, a limited allotment of, of wisdom, of reason within their brains. And Edmund Burke believes that they would be wiser not to just depend on their reason alone, but look to the cumulative reason of the human species, what he calls in this quote, the general bank of capital of nations and ages. So a way to think about this is um, most of the problems that we face in our lives, particularly in our political lives, are things that humanity has been facing from the beginning that thousands, millions of people have dealt with before. They've dealt with them for hundreds, thousands of years. And for us, one of us to come along and say, oh, I've got a better idea. In a way, we are saying, hey, I'm smarter than all those millions of people that lived over those thousands of years of time. They all got this wrong, they screwed it up, and I'm right. Now again, that's possible that that's true. But Edmund Burke's argument was that it's very unlikely that that's true. That if the human species cumulatively, through the ages, had come to certain conclusions about what works best, they're probably right. And this new thinker that comes along with this bright new idea is the one that's probably wrong. So we can describe this notion from Edmund Burke as the wisdom of history. And this is the first principle of conservatism that you need to note in this lesson. This basic idea that wisdom handed down from ages past is probably there because other people thought about these problems just as hard as we think about them today, put as much effort into crafting good answers to them as we would. And if they've cumulatively come up with a certain solution, uh, there's probably a pretty good chance that it's the right solution, is what Edmund Burke would say. Now, the next idea that we get from him is that if we are going to change things, what he wants to see to justify that, that change is practicality. He says that the science of government is practical, and it's intended for practical purposes. He, purposes. he wants to see what works. And therefore, as he says in this quote, it's with infinite caution that we should pull down an edifice. An edifice is talking about the outside structure of something. And what he's talking about is not an actual building here, but the structures of government. It's with infinite caution that we should pull down any structure of government that is answered in any tolerable degree the common purposes of society. In other words, the basic idea is if a thing has generally worked, we should be very hesitant to try to change it. If it isn't broke, don't try to fix it. And this goes back to the previous point, is you may think that you know what to do to make it even better, but odds are that you don't, according to someone like Edmund Burke. That all these millions of people that have thought about this problem for thousands of years and the solution they've come up with, which is working at least to some extent, is actually probably better than what you're thinking up sitting there in your office all by yourself, um, just contemplating abstract ideas. Now, if you're going to get society to change the way you want, then you need to show practical results. You need to show that the thing that you're proposing as a change for everyone actually works. Experiment somehow, try it with a small group, establish that this thing actually is beneficial before you try to get everyone to change and adopt it. So, now this doesn't mean that Edmund Burke was entirely opposed to change. Matter of fact, as he says in this quote, it's not impossible to reconcile the idea of having fixed rules. This is the way we've always done it, and this is how we're always going to do it, and then occasionally deviating from them. As a matter of fact, he says that an ability to change occasionally when necessary is needed um, because without it, you don't have the means to conserve or protect the thing you're trying to protect. So in general, you want to keep society the way it is. 
but every now and then you may need to alter some things to preserve the, the basics of society. So from this, we get a second principle from Edmund Burke. And that is he wants to see practical results, not abstract ideas. Show him that something has really worked in the real world for him to accept it. Don't just come up and say you've got a better idea of how to do things, which in a way is what the radicals were doing in the French National Assembly. Yeah, we know we've always had a king, but we think we shouldn't have one because people like John Locke and Adam Smith say we don't need them. Now, that was very different than what was happening in America, where the Americans, the American colonists that were living there said, well, we don't really need the government back in England overseeing us because we've basically been on our own in the wilderness here for a couple hundred years, um, running our own lives. We've proved we can do it. Again, Edmund Burke's looking for practical evidence. The Americans could give it to him that they were fine without a king. The French had never presented such. We can then move on to the next tenet of conservative for conservatism, as shown to us from Edmund Burke. And to see that, we need to note this idea that he has in this quote, that, that radical change can very easily destroy things that have taken ages to build up. So society is constantly working to improve itself, and over time, um, uh, changes gradually accumulate to make society better and hopefully more prosperous, more free, things like that. But it, the change is slow and gradual. And if someone comes in with too radical a deviation, they can ruin all that in a short time. It's much easier to destroy something than it is to build it. And for that reason, when Edmund Burke, Burke looks around for a statesman, in other words, a, a person to serve in the government, his ideal of the best statesman is somebody with a disposition to improve and an ability, excuse me, a disposition to preserve and an ability to improve. So yes, he wants somebody who's open to change, as we said, cautious change, careful change. It's going to be that something's been proven to him. There's evidence that it'll really work. Yes, he's open to change things because change is sometimes necessary. But his dis disposition, his instinctive reaction to change is, nope, let's keep things the way they are. And we want to keep them the way they are because they've generally worked. And usually when you come up with some crazy change, it's going to make things worse rather than make things better. And if you really want the change, show me that it works in some way. Now what this means then is radical change and particularly revolution should be the last thing that we ever try to do to deal with a problem. We should try gradual incremental changes instead. So the crazy notion that the people in France, uh, when they had never ever run their lives before politically, that they were going to get rid of the all-powerful king and institute a democracy there for Edmund Burke was nuts. It was too radical a change. It was going to end in disaster for sure. So from that, we get his last principle. And that is that change should be cautious. A way to sum up the ideas of, General, of Edmund Burke altogether is with an old saying. Uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, some younger people have never heard this saying because it's uh, based on a custom that hasn't existed commonly in society for a long time. And that is that uh, before we had the indoor plumbing of the modern world, uh, bathing took place in portable tubs that would be filled with water, uh, that was like heated in a fireplace and, and that sort of thing. So you would bathe a baby in a tub sitting on a counter or a table. And you take the baby out of the dirty water and go toss the dirty water out in the yard. That's what people did. Matter of fact, just a few decades, well, several decades ago, there were people that still did this kind of thing. Um, at least 100 years ago. But the notion was that, yes, the dirty bath water has to be thrown out. But you want to make sure you don't throw out the good thing with it, the baby. Well, that's how we should approach our political life, too. There's lots of things in our government and our society that work really well. And when we decide to change the bad things, we shouldn't accidentally mess up the good things at the same time. We should be slow and careful about change. Now, the last thought in this lesson is that conservatives that have this attitude of Edmund Burke of wanting to be slow and careful about change sometimes are described as reactionaries. And in a way, this is a very appropriate description because conservatives don't go around thinking, hey, I've got a great idea, let's change things now. Instead, they generally just keep things the way they are and then you only hear from conservatives when somebody says, oh, I think we should do this and the conservative says, no, don't change that. 
In other words, they're reacting to the other person. But when this term is usually used to describe conservatives, when somebody calls a conservative reactionary, they're actually using it in an insulting way. What they're trying to say is that conservatives never have any good ideas of, all, of their own. All they do is spend their time shooting down other people's ideas. Now, that isn't exactly true, as you'd see with what we learned from Edmund Burke. He's open to the idea of change. He just wants it proved to him that it's going to be good change, and he wants to be slow and cautious. All right, that's it for our lesson. Now let's review. Oops. There you go. There's the correct slide. The right answer is practical results. Next question. Um, what is the conservative view of change? Should change never happen? Should change only happen cautiously? Should change constantly happen? Or should change even be radical and revolutionary? Well, by this point, you should know, obviously, that conservatives like Edmund Burke believe that change should only happen cautiously. Be careful before you change anything. Make sure that it's actually going to work right. And then our last question is, why are conservatives sometimes called reactionaries? Is it because they generally just react to what others are doing? Is it because they address problems quickly? Is it they start discussions about things? Or is it they, they have a revolutionary ideas? Well, you should now re realize that the correct answer is first one, that they react to the ideas of others. The basic premise of conservatism is keeping things the way they are because things have generally worked, and then when somebody suggests making a change, saying, whoa, 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 let's be careful before we do that. All right, that does it for lesson 12. Our next lesson from unit one will be lesson 13, in which we learn about modern liberalism.